Turning your Bibles to 1 Kings, and we're going to start in chapter number 3. We're going through the Old Testament. We're going to go through um, 1st, 2nd Kings, and then 1st and 2nd Chronicles. And then we're going to um, go look at Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. And then I'm working on doing some study on the Gospel of John, which might be a multi-year series. <laughs> I, I, I've been looking at going through outlining Romans 5. I think I have six to eight messages on that chapter. And, and I'm trying to like limit it, but uh, it'll, it'll take us six months or so to get through Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, because I want to lay down Paul's doctrinal foundation before we look at how John um, approaches the gospel so uniquely. Um, but I hope that you're seeing the grace of God throughout the Old Testament. God has always been and will always be a gracious God. And the thing that you, we learned was we looked at King David's life as that he never gives up on us. I don't know about your walk, but I know about my walk. And I'm thankful that he never gives up. Because you think, you know, at, at some point you think like, by, well, by this age, <laughs> at this point of maturity, at this length of being a believer, I shouldn't have any struggles anymore. But we live in a fallen world and there's a tempter and there's a thing called indwelling sin and in flesh and tries to draw us away. And sometimes we stumble and we might sit there and go, man, I just, the, does God just ever get fed up? And the, the answer, what we saw with David was, no. Now, uh, are there horrible consequences for sin? Yes. And is there suffering because of sin and living in a fallen world? Yes. But he loves us and he never gives up on us. And that gives us the courage and the boldness and the willingness to never give up on each other. It's never enough for you and I to sit there and to get a mindset that this, all, this is all about me and what I get from it. Because what God wants to do is not only impact our lives, he doesn't want it to stay static or stagnant even in our own life. He wants it to flow through us. So the things that we receive as the saints of God are intended to transform our hearts, but to be expressed through us. And so as we, we live in the experience of, you know, that God never gives up on us in his grace, well, why are we giving up on each other? We I remember having working under this a preacher when I was working in this real large church many decades ago, and the pastor was teaching on grace, and all of us, all the staff members were like, yeah, he's got grace for himself, but he didn't have any grace for anybody else. It was all performance, and I thought, you know, that's hypocritical. Well, then God kind of showed me, you know, I have some hypocrisy in my own actions and attitudes. Do you? And so don't we want God to kind of clean that out? We saw that King David had many highs. And he had many lows. But God was gracious through it all. Now in 1 Kings, David, uh, we, in, we see, if you read through the whole passage, and I encourage you to read through the week, he has passed away and his son Solomon becomes king. Now there, before we even look at the first verse, you see grace. Because who is Solomon? Solomon is the son that David had with Bathsheba after they lost the son from their affair. Of all the children that David had, and he had dozens of kids. Jesse was talking today in, in community. He said he had seven kids. It's hard to get them all together. I mean, that's nothing, Jesse. David had you. He had you beat, man. Of course, he had a lot more wives, so. <laughs> <laughs> he, had, he had dozens of children. And who did God choose to be his successor? Solomon. You see... You, we, we, we forget how good God really is. So let's begin in verse 3 and 4. 
And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. And Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Well, Father, I pray that the next few minutes you just show me what you want to say. And I'm so grateful to you. Lord, um, for who you are for us. And Lord, I'm so grateful that you never give up. That you plant your very life within the hearts of your children. Uh, of all who believe. And I pray, Lord, that, that all these incredible gifts that you've given to us, that we would let them transform us and then be expressed through us. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Solomon had learned of the love and grace of God from, from his father, King David. Notice very carefully that obedience and sacrifice flowed from love. When we talk about the grace of God, we, we sometimes get a little bit of pushback and people say, yeah, but what about obedience? But when you understand the scriptures clearly, obedience is an outflow of the grace of God. Now, what happens in legalistic religion is obedience becomes an avenue to achieve relationship. And that's what happened to me in, in in, in, in many different denominational experiences, and my growing up was, listen, it was always obey, 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 so that God will accept you. Obey so that God will bless you. Obey so this will happen. But the scripture comes at it completely different. He's saying, listen, obedience is an outflow of being loved. The love of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God, it draws us into the place where we desire to, to be obedient, if you will. He's not there with a, a big stick threatening. And, and I shared with you in the last couple of weeks, you know, someone came to me and said, I just need the fear of God. You don't give me the fear of God. And I'm like, I don't want you to be afraid of God. I want you to fear God in the scriptural sense where you have a reverent regard for his awesomeness. But I don't want you to think that he's up there with a big whooping stick or what the, my friend Alan calls the smite button. You know, that waiting for you to mess up and he pushes the button and, you know, you self-destruct or you have some horrible thing because it, it just distorts your whole vision of God. God made you the object of his love. Yesterday, my um, my... My oldest, or I said mine. He, he's only mine when he's good. He's Vanessa's when he's bad, right? Yeah, all, all the kids, you guys do that? All the kids, you know, they're, they're, they're my kids when they're doing good. And they're Vanessa's kids when they're just acting up. They're so much like their mother. <laughs> really, thankfully, they have a mother, right? They're, they'd be a just total mess. Uh, but our son Ryan came down with... with uh, his son, um, Tiff, uh, Tiff, his wife Tiffany, and his son Logan. And I was just thinking about what a fun thing it is when they're that little. Now, of course, he's a terrorist in training. He's 18 months, he, but he's, he's a crack up. And I just see the way my son loves him. And, I, and, and then I get to smother him with kisses. And I think, what would happen? How, how would our lives be transformed if we understood, understood God loving us this way? I mean, what kind of kid would come to a grandfather or a father who had a stick and said, Hey, if you stumble, if you mess up, I'm going to smack you with this. You'd be reluctant to come. And I think that's why so many people have just abandoned church altogether because their, their understanding is, man, God only loves me on the conditions that I perform well. Religion says sacrifice and obey in order to be loved, but it's all backwards. Why do we give? Why do we sacrifice? I mean, we don't have animal sacrifices to atone for our sins and transgressions, do we? Because Jesus was that sacrifice. We see that in the book of Hebrews. That once for all sacrifice. 
But we're called as believers. Not to, we're not giving so that God will love us. We're not giving just to get something back. We're giving because we are so incredibly blessed and loved by God. And the sacrifices we make for the kingdom of God flow from his love for us. And his unending love for us gives us a heart to obey. It is the grace of God that the scripture says that teaches us to deny ungodliness. He says it's the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. And generosity flows from Solomon as one who has been loved and one who is, knows how to love. It's not enough, right? This is what I was trying to get you to kind of come to the place. It's, the first step is to know how you are loved, but it never ends right here. But these hearts are to burst forth in expressions of love. Now, look at verse number five. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give to you. Do you see the father's heart towards Solomon? He says, ask what you wish. Your father's heart is to lavish you with blessings. If God came to you in a dream tonight and asked you what the desire of your heart was, what would you say? Do you realize what a giving God you have as your father? As I was preparing this and meditating on it, I, I, I just kind of got quiet with the Lord and, and I started thinking, okay, Lord, what's the greatest desire? Is it healing? And, 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 and I've asked God to heal me, you know, many times. But I, I thought, you know, the greatest desire I have is that my life would make an impact for the kingdom of God. I, what, however long I have, no, what, however many years I have, I said, Lord, let it make an impact. Let it make a difference in the lives of others to build your kingdom. Because that's fruitful. And if, if disease has its work and purposes and is used of God to kind of refine me and, 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 and to, to purge what doesn't belong, well then, okay. We all know John chapter 3 verse 16 and hopefully you're learning verse 17 because they're companion verses. But for God so what? Love the world that he did what? So do you see the first premise that God teaches us about his love? He loves and he. So when you think about giving financially, even in, in church, don't think, oh, I got to do this or God will get me. I mean, we were taught that. I think I, I told you the story one time. I, Vanessa, I was working in commercial finance, uh, you know, 30 something years ago and and making pretty good money and, and everything, and but just getting into church. And, and um, this evangelist comes and he preaches this sermon on, on, on tithing, you know. And I wasn't tithing. I was just doing whatever I felt like doing, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, this guy, man, he, he had this sermon on tithing and he scared the hell out of me. Because he said, man, if you don't tithe, God is going to get his tithe. Your tires will wear out. Your water pump will, go bro uh, will break. This will happen. He goes, and, and, and then he had, it, he had us convinced, like, you got to pay your back tithe. I'm thinking, what? I, what? How am I going to do this? And I thought, I can't afford a new water pump. So I'll start tithing. And within weeks, my water pump went out. <laughs> I said, where is that evangelist? So get my hands on him, you know? <laughs> a tithing might be just a wonderful principle, a, a discipline for how you, you, you express giving. But, you know, God ain't going to get you. God says, be filled with my love and then give as an outflow of my love. 
And I never sit there and get a calculator and say, well, you know, I made this much. And, and I always give way, way more than, the, when, than a tithe. Why? Because, man, I just know how loved and blessed I am. But God so loved that he... And so when someone says, hey, I love you, but they never, they never give of themselves or express themselves, they're, they're probably not really loving you, are they? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, and then these are wonderful, should not perish, but, but what? But have eternal life. And so you remember, friends, remember God's love is the beginning point and the source of it all. And he says, you believe in God. You believe in his son, Jesus Christ, and his finished work. You believe in him. And the moment you believe, you have eternal life. Don't be waiting until you die to experience eternal life. Begin to experience eternal life. What? The divine life of God living in you. He says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Why don't we learn verse 17 with verse 16? He didn't come into the world to what? He didn't come in to condemn. And so listen, if you live in a legalistic system, you're going to always feel under condemnation because you're never going to perform well enough, never measure up enough. And he's saying, listen, I love you. You believe on me and that's to have eternal life. Because I didn't come to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And this is why we do missions. Because it's not enough that we know it's an, it, 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 there's a mandate for us to take the gospel into all of the world. I had someone call me in a conversation, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, and they had supported our missions outreach, and they, they were complaining that I was doing uh, wells and housing and food substance to Muslims and Hindus. And I, he, he was like, well, why are you spending money on Muslims and Hindus? They don't love God. And I thought, well, I tried to explain it to him, but I said, this is just the way the, the, that people think. But who does God love? I mean, I, I, if there's a Christian brother in need, you know, and needs food, I'll always get it for him. Always. Our first obligation is to the family of God, the brethren, but, but, but we love our enemies. What, what, you know, I, 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 I dug wells for Muslims and Hindus and I share the gospel with them. I proclaim and demonstrate the love of God to them. Why? Because that's what the gospel is really all about. How do the enemies of God ever know the truth of who God is without the demonstration and proclamation of the gospel? How many of you would have been saved? You didn't start out as the friend of God. You didn't enter into the kingdom of God because you were so good. We all, the scripture says we were all enemies. And so I just want to encourage you, listen, listen, he didn't come to condemn the world. He came that you and I would be light in a dark place. What do you desire? I mean, I just love how these two verses highlight the heart of God. God loved and God gave. He's not out to get you. He's out to get you. Right? Right? Do you say the same words in different ways? He's not out to get you, to destroy you. He's out to get you, to bring you into himself. He blesses us to impact our world with his love. His enemies with his love. Love makes us missional people, not consumers. This is... Uh, you know, maybe we need to stop here and think. Are we consumers? I mean, I, I heard something on the news last week about the consumer, you know, what do they call it? Some kind of consumer index, something? I mean, whatever, it just means that Americans are spending a lot of money. 
<laughs> and they were talking about the economy and the stock market. And they said, the, cons- the, the I can't remember what the word was. The guy was saying something, but man, the consumer whatever index is way up. Looks like it's going to be a blockbuster Thanksgiving and Christmas season. Well, cool, it makes our economy work. But do we bring consumerism into the church? Do we bring consumerism into our relationship with God? Do we bring consumerism in and say, listen, you know, the reason I'm, I, I, I'm here for what I can get. I'm, you know, I, 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 I know it sounds like mean and harsh. I don't mean it that way. But, you know, I've been doing ministry for 30 something years and I've just kind of grown accustomed to people with a mindset that say, you know, what, what do you got for me? I got Jesus for you. But there's never the end. You are never the ending point. You know, I mean, I'll do my best to prepare and to pray and to visit you and encourage you and teach you. And, 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 but, and, but the greatest challenge is to challenge you to live beyond yourself. To, to realize that all of these gifts that you and I receive from God weren't meant just to settle deep in our own chests. Not, you know, or, or knowledge or information, you know, and just to settle in our heads like, hey, I got more information. No, Christ died for us so that he could live in us and living in us. His heart's desire is to re- express and manifest, reveal, however you want to put it, his life through us. Uh, Paul says that the fragrance of Christ might emanate from us. And this is where we've gotten it all wrong because so much of the world looks at the Christian church and all they sense is condemnation and disapproval. So are we consumers? Just about what we can get out of it? Or have we been truly impacted? Because love was never meant. It's true in a relationship. Love is never meant to be one way. What happens in a, in a, in a relationship if love gets one way? Divorce. Separation. Anxiety. You know, rejection. What, 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 love, love, if you will, is, is meant to flow back and forth. Back and forth, but not just back and forth in the vertical, but the back and forth in the horizontal. There's a reason we sing the song. They will know we are Christians by our knowledge, by our knowledge. That's a little hard, huh? Knowledge. But, do, but what, are we, what are we very proud of? Or what we know and other people don't know. But people don't care what you know until they know that you love them. Have you ever had a conversation and try and get someone straight on something? I have. Go visit someone. Hey, I got to get this person straight. Give them all kinds of information. They don't care. They don't care about what you know. They care how you love. And he's saying, listen, I want that love that that comes down from above to so impact you that that it flows back in how you love God, but not just how you love God, how you love your fellow man. Jesus in the gospel says, love your neighbor as your poor neighbor. Oh, am I right? Sometimes. <laughs> I mean, if you don't experience the overwhelming love that God has for you, how, how are you going to love your neighbor? You're going to love your neighbor as you perceive. And if you think God's up there just to get you to smack you around every time you mess up, what are you going to do to the people out there? 
And isn't this how the, the church world has expressed itself to the unbelieving world? God's up there ready to smack you. So instead of loving and serving people, we protest. Get out there and love them. He's saying, allow this love to so overwhelm and to fill us and to flow. Psalm 56 verse 9 says, Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know. And look at this, because I underline this. This is, it just hit me. Even in the Old Testament, you see it all the way through. That God is for me. God is for me. Now, if you live in the same world that I live in, sometimes you wait, what? Haven't you been through a stage or a phase in your life that you thought, man, what is going on? And if you don't have this vertical relationship that is overwhelmed and motivated where God is the source of all love and you live in this horizontal fallen world, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be saying, what? Then you listen to enough Christian television, then you're going to be really confused. No, I'm serious. I listen to some of it and I'm like, what? The guys that really get me are the guys that want you to buy them a jet plane. <laughs> like, come on. People. Fraud. Warning. Warning. People don't know. They could buy them the plane. Jesus barely rode on a donkey. But if you're a consumer, it makes sense because they sell you the lie. It's all about you. And if you do this for them, then you're going to get this. But this is what I need you to understand before you leave. That this God who, beyond our ability to conceive, this God calls, we call Abba, he loves us. He loves us when we're sinners. He loves us when we are enemies. And he says, I'm for you. So now in our lives, when we live in the presence that God is for who? Me. Then when difficulties come into my life, I know this isn't God punishing me for some past failure. It's part of living in a fallen world. And I have his promise that he will use all things together for good. So divorce, is that good? No. But can he use it for good? And cancer, is it good? But can he use it for good? And Parkinson's, is it good? <laughs> no. But can he use it for good? And then I live in this presence that this isn't God trying to get me to destroy me because of some past failure because David never would have made it to the end. But what does he teach? He teaches his son that God is for me. And this is what I need you to walk away with is to walk away in the present reality that God is for you no matter what financial, health, Family relationship problem, God is for you. Consumers have this transactional mentality that says, listen, if I just do these things, if I tithe and I witness to people and I do this and I come to church on Sunday and I do this, then I'm going to have, then I'm going to check out. And by doing all these things, I will get these things. It's like going to H-E-B, right? I just give them the money and I get certain things. And so many people relate to God. I just do these things and God gives me these things. But you know what? God never promised you a life without suffering. He promised you a life with, with his presence in suffering. And when you're in pain, he's for you. Physical pain. 
solical pain. You live in the present. He's for me. Am I confused about the why of what's going on in the world? Absolutely, I'm confused. Why? But I know this. He's for me. Look at one more verse. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Therefore, the Lord waits to be what? The Lord what? He waits to be, say it. Gracious, Gracious to who? Isn't that amazing? You think this was something that Paul wrote, but this is something Isaiah wrote. He said, this is God's heart to you. God's heart to you is what? He's just waiting for opportunities to show you his grace. To pour out his love in your life. This is why Paul writes to Timothy and he said, listen, the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness. He said, listen, I'm just waiting to pour out my unmerited favor. I was waiting to pour out my love and life to you. And when you begin to understand who God is for you and his heart towards you, it changes everything. It changes everything. I mean, I'm not blaming any denomination or anything. I just, you know, I'm just saying I grew up and I had a distorted view of God. I had this idea that God was up there and he was demanding and never happy. You know, maybe it's like some psychological projection from I thought my dad was never happy. <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think you have to find out who to blame, right? Just to recognize, men, listen, I had a distorted view of God. And it drove me and drove me and drove me trying to make God happy with me, trying to get his pleasure only to discover he was just waiting to be gracious to me. He was waiting for me to come to the end of my own resources so that he could be the source. Not only is he waiting to be gracious to you, it says, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. The grace of God is, you know, one of those little theological terms is the grace of God is giving, God giving to you what you could never deserve and the mercy of God is God not giving to you what you do deserve. How many of you have felt like, I don't deserve this? There's, a, there's an old cowboy movie, and Clint Eastwood is shooting and killing everybody, and the guy goes, I don't deserve this. And he goes, deserve ain't got nothing to do with it. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you, I'll be honest, you know. I mean, I'll be plain, old-fashioned, just honest with you. I don't want what I deserve. And I'm the preacher. I don't know about you. <laughs> but I'm glad that he exalts himself. In showing mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. And blessed are all those who wait for him. Listen. Listen. Let God begin to transform your mind. Some of you have been through some incredible hardship. Painful divorces. Broken family relationships. Health problems. Live with pain. Struggle. And, and, and listen. All I, I need to, to get you to go is this. Uh, will, will you go vertical? A moment and just see that God smiles upon you. He loves you. He loves you in your pain. He loves you in your struggle. He lives you, loves you in your trials. He loves you in your failures. He doesn't love your failure because it just, it hurts you. But he loves you in your failure. He's, the scripture says, for you. Not against you. 
And so he gives us these incredible promises that he will use all things together for good. Because what? We love him. Because what? Because we're called according to his purpose. Father, thank you for loving us. And I hope that I never let that not be the first thought that comes to my mind. That you love me. And I pray, Lord, for each person here that you would change our worldview. And that you give us a clear vision of who you are for us. That you love us. No matter what we go through. No matter what hardship we face. No matter what suffering. Lord, we are not consumers. We are disciples. We are vessels that receive abundantly your love. And have a heart to express love. To who? To the enemies. To the sinners. And I pray that would be transformative in our lives. And I pray that you just show yourself mighty, Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray.